Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning from here on the lands of the Southern Paiute in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I am very excited to welcome you to our webinar this morning uh, with our partnership with uh, Ascendium. Uh, my name is Jason Gilbo. I am the executive director of ASH, the Association for the Study of Higher Education. Uh, I'm here to give you a few logistical pieces, um, an overview of the platform we're using today. I will then turn it over to Kirsten to share a little bit about Ascendium and then uh, finally turn it over to Nick and Andrew for uh, the majority of today's uh, webinar. So within the Zoom platform, uh, if you need uh, captions, you can press the CC button or the live transcript button in your menu bar, and that will provide you uh, Zoom uh, AI captioning. Uh, we also have the chat open for our attendees today. We encourage you uh, to introduce yourself, share where you're coming from, tell other folks hello. Uh, for our panelists today, they will keep an eye on the Q&A. So uh, they will not be monitoring the chat, but if you have questions or comments, feel free to put those in the Q&A uh, and we'll have some time at the end to respond to uh, those questions. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Kirsten from Ascendium. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending upon where you're calling in from. My name is Kirsten Yato and I'm a program officer at Ascendium Education Group. Uh, before we dive in here, I do want to note that I'm calling in from Milwaukee, Wisconsin today, and I want to acknowledge that I come to you this afternoon while in the traditional territory of the Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Potawatomi people. Uh, before we dive in, um, I want to thank the ASH team for hosting the webinar today and thank all of you for taking the time to join us. I'm going to take just a few moments to share a little bit more about who Ascendium is and provide some context uh, for how we got to this conversation. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Okay. Nick or Andrew, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Wonderful, we are good to go. Okay, so um, for those who may not be familiar with Ascendium, um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization committed to helping people reach their education and career goals. And in addition to being a federal student loan guarantor and provider of student financial wellness services, we are also a growing national philanthropy that invests in initiatives designed to increase the number of students from low income backgrounds who complete a post-secondary degree, credential or workforce training program that provides a clear path to a good job and upward socioeconomic mobility. Well, we realize that there are very real barriers that prevent individuals from earning a degree or credential. And Ascendium's grant making is very focused on driving systemic change that results in more equitable post-secondary education and workforce outcomes for learners from low-income backgrounds, especially for the populations that you see on this slide here. In 2019, Ascendium launched a new national grant making strategy that included a focus on rural communities and the learners and workers within them. Our commitment to investing in post-secondary education and workforce training in rural places was very much driven by the data. We know that disparities between rural learners and their urban and suburban counterparts exist at every point in the post-secondary pipeline from enrollment to completion. And as we engage with researchers and institutional leaders uh, working in and in support of rural post-secondary education and training, we very quickly realized that one of our challenges was going to be defining what we mean by rural and more specifically how we define rural institutions. So we were very excited to partner with two exceptional researchers and their teams who over the last year and a half or so have really taken a much deeper dive into defining what we mean by a rural located institution and what we mean by a rural serving institution. And the research and tools that you'll hear about today are distinct yet very much related. And together, they really provide a foundation upon which we can more clearly identify, understand, and support rural institutions and the learners that they serve. We think that these tools will be incredible assets for researchers specifically, and we're really pleased to have this opportunity to describe this work in more detail today. I'm going to leave the details uh, to our experts who I will briefly introduce you to before I turn things over to them. 
Um, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Andrew Karisic, Associate Professor of Higher Education at Appalachian State University and Executive Director of the Alliance for Research on Regional Colleges. You'll then hear from Dr. Nicholas Hillman, Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis and Director of the Student Success Through Applied Research Lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Both Dr. Krisich and Dr. Hillman have been phenomenal partners to Ascendium. I have learned so much, uh, both with and from them, um, and I'm very excited for them to share their work with us today. So with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Krisich. All right, thank you, Kirsten. Um, good afternoon to folks uh, Eastern and Central, uh, and good morning to folks uh, on the Western part of the country. Uh, as, as Kirsten said, I am Andrew Karisic. I'm the Executive Director at the Alliance for Research on Regional Colleges, uh, as well as being an Associate Professor of Higher Education at Appalachian State. And so before I get started uh, talking really about the meat of, of our project, I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge that Appalachian State University recognizes the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the land on which our campus is located. The Cherokee, Catawba, and other indigenous peoples left their mark as hunters, healers, traders, travelers, farmers, and villagers long before the university was established. Today, descendants of these communities, which include citizens of the eight tribal nations in North Carolina, as well as others, live and work in this region, an area with settler, settler colonial policies, including those that attempt to disenfranchise, remove, and eradicate indigenous people and their way of life. Our team at ARC is distributed across the country. Uh, we are officially located here uh, in Boone, North Carolina at Appalachian State. We also, you can see we have team members uh, and members of our leadership team spread out at institutions across the country, as well as administrative support staff here on campus. Getting into the meat of the project that our team undertook, um, it's really, I think, important for us to frame why we needed to think about rural serving institutions, why we needed to put some common language and framework around that. Uh, and here's sort of the four really big motivators for this work. Um, but having a way to talk about these institutions and identify them makes it much easier to facilitate and encourage research on these institutions, which we need much, much more of than what the field already has. It allows us to better advocate for funding and policy changes for these institutions by being able to, again, find the institutions doing this work. Um, there's a part of this that it's really hard to talk about these institutions if there isn't a common language for talking about these institutions. Additionally, one thing we heard from college leaders is that the absence of a rural serving institution framework or definition sort of made it challenging for them to find appropriate peer institutions beyond our existing frames of sector and Carnegie classification to really account for what is unique about the rural serving mission. And lastly, so that we can better measure the contributions of these institutions to students and communities to tell these stories that we know are there, uh, we just need to make it easier for those stories to be told. And so our approach from this, uh, there are sort of three central features that through the work co course of this project, we, it really moved us from coming up with a strict definition and more to kind of a metric that's a little bit more flexible um, for this work. For ours, uh, with this rural serving piece, we were really intentional in that servingness aspect of the term. Um, we wanted to look beyond just location um, to find a, an account for the institutions that are not in a place formally classified as rural, but are still doing really important work and service to these students and communities. Uh, thinking as some really clear examples, thinking of land grant colleges, uh, many of them have gotten large and complex and have sort of urbanized their communities. And so they don't get classified as being in a rural place, but that rural service is still a really important part of what those institutions do. And even thinking about regional universities and community colleges that sort of exist on suburban peripheries of, of, of urban areas where everything farther out is rural, those institutions are doing this work too. And so we wanted to build a tent that was big enough for all of that. We wanted to make sure that that serving this aspect included rural specific features, um, not just things that meant to be serving students in need, um, because those students exist in a lot of places, but really anchoring to what is uniquely rural. 
And lastly, this decision to move beyond sort of the strict definition that you know necessitates a checklist of criteria that an institution has to be this, it can't be that, and here's a yes, no list. We moved to an index score to really account for more nuance and a lot of gray area in both thinking about morality and what it means to serve these communities. Approaching this work, there are several limitations that we really had to work within and around. One is using a strict enrollment-based approach. So saying you have X percentage of students on your campus that come from rural areas. This is not something that is captured in any national data system. Uh, and even if it is, we would have to figure out what definition of rural we mean, and there are dozens. Um, and so we can't take the approach of some of the minority serving institution designations that include a component of how many, what percent of those students come from a rural community. Uh, there is no one perfectly agreed upon definition of rural, as I already said, which complicates both coming up with that enrollment approach, but also just thinking about the places that these institutions are located in and serve. And lastly, the data don't allow us on sort of a national scale for all institutions to get as deep as we wanted to in sort of the quality of rural service, looking specifically at like graduation rates among rural students and things like that because of some of these same data limitations. So with the metric that we did come up with, we wanted to sort of hedge our bets a little bit about one, around one definition of rural when there are no perfect ones. And so we use multiple complementary measures of place that look at the raw population size. We look at the percentage of the population in the institution's home county and the surrounding counties that are classified as rural. And looking at adjacency to metropolitan areas, rural away from a city is different than rural close to a city. We also wanted to think about that rural specific piece of servingness and things that institutions do um, it, that actually they do in, the, in, in service of these communities. And we really focused in on the credentials that are being produced in fields of unique rural importance. For this purpose, agriculture, natural resources and parks and recreation. And these, this came both from our own research as well as data analysis that we were doing on our data set that these three had really clean break for these institutions. And lastly, again, the, the index score allows us to deal with more nuance um, and also allows us to sort of figure out where the right place is um, to start talking about these institutions. And for this purpose, we wanted to really say if you're above average in your rural servingness, we're talking about you as an RSI. From this work, we come with 1,087 total institutions that we're calling rural serving. Um, we can see that it's more than half of the public two-year sector uh, a third of four-year private institutions, 46% of public four-year, and of the small two-year private sector, about 36% there as well. And at first that number might seem really large, but we've got about 92% of the landmass in our country is classified as rural. Um, and these institutions tend to be low enrollment. Uh, and so these are communities placed where they need to be to serve these communities because they deserve access to higher education as well. But the, what we see is the enrollments are smaller. And so with lots of rural places, we would expect that there are lots of rural serving institutions. And what's also important is to think about what we've done here and what we haven't done here. The index score approach really is important to us because we didn't wanna say rural in a vacuum, serving in a vacuum. We wanted to really say that it's relative. So the index score allows us to compare institutions to each other rather than in sort of isolation from each other. When we made the cut at the mean, that's a score of 1.175, we had rescaled our score to run from zero to four um, rather than include anything neg any negative values. Uh, and above one standard deviation, we also wanted to highlight high RSIs to really get at the point that as a collective, they're, they're not just homogeneous institutions, there is differentiation and diversity among that group. This isn't to say that institutions below these scores aren't rural serving in any way. Um, this is just saying the ones that we've identified are doing and are positioned to do more. Um, a couple of notes of clarification. We are not, we have not built this to turn it into a dichotomous RSI or not um, predictor variable to use. It's really to think about institutions together, similar, different, divergent, um, in a way that makes sense for the work you are doing. And also, this is not intended and should not be used as a way to rank institutions as RSIs. 
Um, having a higher RSI score doesn't mean you're the uh, you're not the number one RSI um, because of that relative nature. We're, we're really not trying to. We really don't want it to be seen as higher, lower, better, worse. It's just more rural serving, less rural serving. And so I want to shift gears here. I'm going to transition over to show our map tool. Um, there's a lot here. And so for the sake of time, I want to make sure that I don't get too far into some of this because you'll all be able to play around with this. It's available at our on our website, which is just regionalcolleges.org. Um, you can find it from our project page. Uh, and, you, and then you can also expand the map to then be full screen, which is what I'm going to use here. Many of the map loads we see on the right over here, the score 1.175, that mean that I was just talking about, up to four. So what we're seeing is our collection of RSIs, 1,087 out of 2,500 total institutions. Uh, each of these globes, these yellow globes, are clusters of institutions for sort of the ability to represent a lot of institutions in, on a map cleanly. But as you sort of click on these and you zoom in farther, uh, the points disaggregate and they correspond to the sidebar on the right for different sectors of institutions. And you can turn on and off any of those sectors that you want. Um, and so for the purposes of this, I'm gonna come over to North Carolina and we're gonna turn off everything but the four-year public universities. We're gonna look just uh, right here. Um, and if I only wanna look at one state, you can do that. You can look at multiple states at a time. Um, but I'm only going to look at North Carolina. Uh, and there's other customizations we can do from here. We can filter based on enrollment size. So you can set custom ranges of enrollment sizes. Uh, you can look at the whole the whole range. Uh, degrees awarded. Uh, and so this is a multi select So associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees, you know, I'll get rid of the associates there so we get some institutions. Uh, and master's degrees uh, and so on. Um, we can also do the single select of what is the highest degree that the institution awards. Um, looking at Pell percentages, so looking at uh, institutions maybe serving a similar percentage of students receiving Pell grants. We also have Carnegie classification built in. Um, in here, you'll see that we sort of aggregated some of the categories just for usability. Um, but as you get into the actual data, the specific, each of the specific categories comes through in the data. We have institutional designations, both to account for federal designations uh, for HBCUs, tribal colleges, and land grants. Um, we also wanted to sort of account for sort of MSI institutions, but there, for folks that know these programs, there can be a lot of reasons why an eligible institution does, doesn't receive the grant. And we didn't really want to get into making a value call of where it counts. Um, getting, getting the federal grant, being just eligible for waiver, or just have to apply, we wanted to focus really on that enrollment piece. Uh, and so we just used the enrollment thresholds for each of these four programs from the federal government, 25%, uh, 40%, 10%, and 10%, and used that to develop these high enrolling for, for different uh, racial groups. We also have county traits. These come from the United States Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service, and they classify every county that has any of these uh, economic uh, or demographic stressors that come through around persistent poverty, low education, low unemployment, et cetera. Uh, and so one thing that's really important here, you have a lot of freedom to navigate and decide what you look at. You can always open the RSI score up all the way and look at all institutions. Um, and so there's a lot of flexibility there. One of the things that is really helpful is you can download our full data set from, from this view. You can also just download a data file that's just what you're looking at right now. Um, and so I'm gonna just download this and hopefully it's gonna unzip easily uh, for me here. And so as Excel's opening, I should have had Excel open already. But what we're gonna expect to see here are these five institutions that are listed on the map. Uh, sorry about that. Come on, Excel. All right. Well, while I'm doing this, um, you're able, as we go through, uh, if you're tired of looking at what you're looking at, we have a reset button that just takes you right back to how the map uh, was when you loaded, and you can filter from there. So here we've got the uh, CSV file that comes up, all five institutions that we were just talking about. So if we want to zoom in farther, 
uh, and get a little bit more into the data, we can do that. Um, we're going to go back over to our North Carolina institutions. What we were just looking at, we're going to pick Appalachian State. What we see are the counties that we were talking about, their home county, their adjacent counties, so we can sort of see what we're talking about here. And the view on the right changes. Uh, we start to see all of the different aspects of the RSI score that come in here, all of those different data points, as well as its associated score. Um, we get student body information, um, enrollments, um, breakdown by race and ethnicity, percentage of adult students, and then all of these things that you can filter the map based on, we list all of that, including their full Carnegie uh, designation and the like, um, and some just additional employee and financial information. We can also uh, actually click multiple institutions here, and I'm going to open up a little bit so that I can get a few more. Uh, so we'll go back, we have App State. When you click on a second institution, you can replace the one you're looking at, or you can actually compare the two, which is what we're going to do. And so the counties here, UNC Wilmington, um, those highlight. And what we see are two public universities in the same system in different parts of state, basically geographic opposite parts of the state. And that comes through when we compare all of these components and their scores. Um, and so this is really a way to see how the index score really does come out of the different data points that we collected, looking at differences in the proportion of the percentage of degrees in those fields, looking at rural populations in the region, adjacencies to cities and the like. The other thing that we can do uh, from this is you can actually download a zip file that includes not only the data, the CSV data for each of these institutions, but it also allows you to look and use some of the graphics that are in here, the graphs and things like that. Um, and so what I would just say for this, we really wanted the map to be flexible and we wanted it to be customizable so that it can really work best for you uh, with what you want to do. And we make it so that you can plug it in easily to other data sets as well. And so just in conclusion, we have other resources available on our project website, complete data files, full documentation, a full explanation of how we got to where we got, um, as well as other things that are gonna be coming, research briefs and the like. Uh, and so we really hope that you all will use it for state level analyses, that qualitative scholars will use it to help select sites to study these institutions and students. Um, and also thinking about how we examine things like transfer pathways to and through different RSIs. Um, everything is there for you to use. Uh, you don't need our permission to use our data. All we ask is that you cite us when you do. So I'm going to stop sharing and I will turn it over to Nick. Wonderful. Andrew, thank you so much. And the time is central time, at least 125. So I will do my part to stay as punctual as you. <laughs> so great job. And thank you uh, for sharing and for setting this up so well. Um, I am Nick Hillman. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, the university is on ancestral home to the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, to link um, um, statements to actions, uh, I would um, encourage all of us who are at universities to see what's in your government relation uh, staff's portfolio and who uh, has a portfolio that includes tribal relations uh, in addition to federal uh, relations and state relations. Tribal relations is um, incredibly uh, important to institutionalize in one way or another. Um, I would love to share four things today uh, about our mapping tool that along with Jared Colston, who's a doc student uh, at UW-Madison, I think might even be in, in, the, in the meeting today, um, Joshua Bach Hansen, um, who is a former uh, uh, student in the lab, and then Audrey Peake. Um, we were on a research team supported by this uh, Ascendium work, and we worked very closely with Kirsten along the way uh, in developing these ideas and developing the tool uh, that I'll be sharing in just a minute. So um, please, you know, I'm looking at who's, who's in the room here, the participants. Uh, I'd love to share my experience working with Ascendium, working on this project, uh, tips along the way of how to work with, um, with uh, philanthropists and, and partners uh, in this space. So please do keep that in mind. Um, but I said four things um, that I wanna share and uh, please, you know, stop me at any time or put questions along the way. The first is the purpose of our work. Um, why did we do this work in the first place? The second is an overview of our approach to the work. And so um, that will include some of the data uh, analytics and, and the decisions that we made in that process. The third will be our main findings. Um, there are many we could um, also share, but I'll focus on just a few. 
Um, and then finally, uh, considering the purpose of this uh, seminar and being uh, sponsored by ASH, um, I'd love to um, plot out just a couple of ideas for further research, things that if we had more time, we might have done uh, on this project. So again, purpose, approach, findings, uh, and further research. So um, as Andrew said earlier, the setup was just great. So I'm not gonna uh, rehash most of that, um, but our program officers at Ascendium started to call us the salt and pepper shakers. Uh, we complement each other very well. Insert your favorite spices there. Um, but um, the work uh, that Andrew just laid out is on, on serving, it's rural serving institutions. Um, and, and that's a very important part of the puzzle to understand this, um, this work. At the same time, um, we have another pillar here, another, um, another spice about rural located institutions. I'm just saying, wait a second, wait, where the heck are these places even in the first place? Um, and I wanna share some examples of why that's an important question to answer. Uh, and so our purpose was to explore these rural located colleges. That doesn't necessarily mean they're serving the rural areas, uh, but it certainly means that they're located in one. Um, and the other purpose is to really just help us build some data sets some publicly accessible data sets. They're very labor intensive to build. And so we've taken on that labor. Jared uh, Colston, a doc student here at UW-Madison, carried a lot of that burden of building these data sets up, uh, developing the code, the programming code to routinize these things and, and update them along the way. Uh, so we've got a lot of infrastructure there. We wanna share it. We want others to use it. And so please, just like what Andrew said, uh, all we ask is you cite us. Uh, if you find ways you might wanna collaborate, even better. Um, but please, uh, we hope this is a tool that you can use um, in, in your own work. So purpose, that, that's, that's the first part, purpose. Um, rural located and then data tools. Um, our approach was very team oriented. Um, like I said, Jared, uh, Josh, Audrey and I uh, really ran with this project, but our approach um, had some very basic questions to answer from the very beginning that are certainly not easy to answer. We had to define what rural even meant. How are we gonna operationalize that concept? I wanna share what we did. Um, we have a report, uh, Jared, I don't know if you're on right now, but you could put the link up to the report or maybe Jason could perhaps. Uh, so we have a report that documents this in more detail. Uh, we have a interactive webpage. I'll share my screen in a minute to, sh to show. But uh, our first step was to define what we meant by a rural area. Um, and so that actually combines two things. What's rural and what's an area? So the rural part, we use the US Department of Agriculture's um, rural urban continuum codes, RUC codes. These uh, range from a score of one to nine. And essentially we took um, non-metropolitan areas and those are what we call rural uh, places. Now RUC codes are county level data points. And so we know people uh, live beyond counties. And what Andrew was just sharing, sort of these counties that are adjacent to each other and like the communities that um, are, are very interconnected and woven together go far beyond individual counties. And so we identify our rural counties, but then we had to figure out these rural counties all kind of cluster together in a systematic way. And instead of us deciding how to cluster these counties together, we used um, a professor from Penn State, uh, Chris Fowler and his team uh, has developed what's called a, the commuting zone score. Now, uh, the Department of Agriculture used to make these commuting zones uh, based off of census labor to work data. It's fascinating. They would find out from IRS where you work uh, and then find out from uh, your tax records where you live. And they would calculate the distance between the two and they would statistically uh, figure out in using the 1980, 90 and 2000 census data uh, where different counties kind of cluster together and share a common labor force. And so these commuting zones are derived from uh, employment records. Now, uh, it has limitations, but it also has some great strengths. We decided to lock in on these commuting zones. Uh, Raj Chetty, who's done a lot of work connecting IRS tax records with uh, income mobility um, and the Chetty team with uh, Opportunity Insight, they also use these commuting zones. I think there's a lot of promise to use commuting zones in research. Uh, and so we're using commuting zones, um, but commuting zones aren't measured on rurality. So we had to kind of create it. We said, well, how many rural counties are in these commuting zones? and how many people live in those rural counties. And then we basically population weighted commuting zones according to how many rural counties and the population in rural counties there are. So I'm happy to revisit any of that, but it seems easy to find out these rural places. It's not easy at all. We have to make some decisions along the way that some of us might disagree with. Uh, and that's, that's good. I think we need to sort this stuff out as a, as a research community. So we have rural places. Um, and then we have to find out the colleges located in those places. So we pegged um, the latitude and longitude of these colleges uh, to their commuting zone. 
we, again, Jared Colston, uh, please, I hope if you don't know Jared yet, connect with him and he can uh, talk through more details of how we went about this process. Um, but essentially, uh, we tied um, US Department of Education data on the college locations to those commuting zones. Now, um, it seems easy enough to figure out where an institution is. You just go to iPads, the integrated post-secondary education data system um, to figure out where college is located. And that's true um, to some extent. The way that a college gets into iPads is they have to fill out a program participation agreement with the US Department of Education. And the program participation agreement, the PPA is really in the weeds, but really important for understanding the data generation process of how data come to be in the public domain. And uh, a PPA could be signed by a single institution, sort of the main campus, and then they could have it be applied to all the umbrella campus locations within, or it could be for every individual campus. So there's a lot of range when you go into iPads on where you would uh, find colleges. Uh, and so we used iPads to some extent, but we actually ended up kind of overcorrecting. And we frankly, we stumbled into a data set um, and it's unaudited uh, and it's based off of accreditation uh, records, uh, information that colleges themselves provide to the US Department of Education in order to get access to federal student aid. Um, but this data set, the um, DAPIP is the, uh, the shorthand uh, name for it. It stands for the Database of Accredited Post-Secondary Institutions and Programs. And maybe, Jared, I don't know if I could put you on the spot again, but if you want to share that link, that'd be great. Um, but this includes, like I said, it overcorrects. It includes all the different programs that are offered at institutions. And we'll talk about what those look like in a second. So we kind of have this um, uh, um, Goldilocks problem. We have, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. We want to try to find the right mix of uh, very granular program level data from DAPIP versus the big picture data from iPads. And we're going to try to make sense of that. And so I'm still on the second part here of our approach, defining rural, defining location, and defining institutions themselves, actual colleges or programs. And so that um, has taken us a lot of um, energy, a lot of time, uh, a lot of resources to develop, and we've made it all publicly available for you to download. Uh, and, and please, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear responses on how it might be useful in your own work. Uh, and we'll demonstrate, I'll demonstrate a tool in just a second to show that. Um, we had to do one more thing, one more decision along the way after getting the data managed and wrangled. We had to also decide what do we mean as a research team, as a rural place. And we decided to be a little bit subjective. We said if the commuting zone has over half of its population living in a rural county, then we will call it rural for the purposes of our report. And uh, in the interactive tool, you can make your own definition of rurality. You can have different thresholds if you'd like. But for the purposes of our report, for getting the work done, uh, we made that as our threshold. And so we thought, well, the majority of people live in what the US Department of Agriculture calls a, a rural county. So we're running with that. Um, so purpose, um, our approach, now with our findings. So I'm just going to highlight three things here really briefly. Um, uh, with the first finding, when we use iPads data and we find these rural located colleges, again, we're looking for colleges that are located in a commuting zone where the majority of the population is in a rural county. Um, we found 516 uh, colleges in the iPads data set. Uh, and that's, that's um, a, a very sizable number. That's uh, really, I think, a, a great uh, starting point for building this out. Um, we then analyzed using iPads data, we then analyzed enrollment trends, classification of these institutions. We looked at American Community Survey um, statistics around uh, the commuting zone um, economy and demographic profile and so forth. Uh, but I, I'd say one of the biggest findings, and I think an important contribution of our report, was that we found something that we sort of, we all kind of might know or have heard about or like assume, uh, but it, college enrollments in rural areas, uh, I'm sorry, I should be more clear, colleges located in rural commuting zones have enrollments that have been dropping faster than non-rural places. And so, um, you know, it's important sometimes to just make a record uh, and just document stuff that maybe is um, obvious. And sometimes when you do, you might find some surprises. And we did. Uh, we found that um, community colleges located in rural areas, their enrollments have been falling faster than uh, non-rural community colleges. Um, and we found some similar patterns when it came to like bachelor's institutions and master's degree granting institutions, these public regional campuses. But something different though is going on in doctoral and research oriented universities, uh, both in the public and nonprofit sectors. Uh, those that are located in rural places 
their enrollments are growing just fine. And so it really helps us think about the um, contours of rurality. There isn't one sort of monolithic definition of what rural means. And even if so, um, there's so much variation about individual life experiences um, and uh, contexts in these rural places that really matter. And I think our work helps kind of give some framework so that we can, as a community, keep building that out even further. I know people have already done that and we're just trying to contribute. Um, so that's on the iPad side. So the first thing was that we found 500 iPads colleges. The second thing was that these enrollments have been declining. We found some really interesting patterns there. But the third finding is that if we use these, um, the DABIP data, uh, this sort of program level data that gets beyond the program participation agreement that uh, colleges have with um, U.S. Department of Education for iPads, if we go beyond that data and we kind of go the opposite end of the extreme, we have about almost 2,500 rural located um, uh, locations. Uh, sometimes they're very small programs. Sometimes they're branch campuses. Uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. But when using the DAPIP data, I think we get a far more inclusive view of what kind of post-secondary opportunities are there in rural places. Um, there are, if we use DAPIP, there are um, almost two times as many institutions now. Uh, remember with iPads, we have 516. With DAPIP, we have 981, almost 1,000 now. So by using a different data set, we get a more inclusive view of the locations. Um, we also can see these branch campuses that play a really important role in a lot of these places. And there's over 1,000 of those. And so uh, by using this DAPIP data set, we think we've created a more representative view of, of what colleges are located in rural areas. Uh, big caveat, remember I said it's unaudited data. So we're still figuring out the, uh, the quirks with that particular data set. Um, but I wanna share with you now uh, the, the tool that we developed and I'll just share my screen here. Uh, and so again, um, as I do that, I'm just gonna reflect on the, the four purposes here or the four kind of points that we're trying to make in this presentation. The first uh, being the purpose of the work. The second being uh, our approach to the work. And I just ran through the third thing, which is our findings. And so let me just share some more findings and then we'll jump into the further research ideas. And I'll pause for just a split second to just make sure that I'm not missing anything. And if so, Jason, please jump in. Okay, so I'll take a breath. Uh, so um, uh, mappingruralcolleges.wisc.edu. Uh, and again, Jared, uh, if you don't mind putting the map in there uh, in the chat. This is the landing page. Uh, actually, you know, actually, technically, this is the landing page, uh, but you could uh, download the full report right here in the PDF version. You could just go ahead and download the data uh, directly, and I can walk through that briefly if, if that's of interest. You can download the da full data set, but don't forget to also download the data dictionary and always reach out if you have any questions uh, along the way. And we updated this data a few months ago. You have some more documentation here that kind of explains what I just walked through. Uh, and then we have, of course, the map. And so if you were to start at the map, you have basically three decisions to make up here on the left. Um, and let me just scroll out just a bit. So to show we do have Alaska and Hawaii uh, and, um, uh, and the continental US uh, all in there and I believe Puerto Rico. Um, but we have, I'm gonna focus on a place that's familiar to me. And I think each of us on this call is probably looking at home, wherever you're most familiar with. You're like, okay, let's see if he gets this right. Uh, but you have three decisions, a few decisions to make. The first is to figure out a location type. So I'm gonna briefly share again, our approach to figuring out these institutions. Uh, Joshua Back Hansen uh, went through the DAPIP data qualitatively and used NVivo to find out how uh, institution names clustered together so we could find uh, locations that were branch campuses, then we coded them. We and several undergraduate research uh, assistants also participated and coded all of these different location types. We ended up with this list over here on the left that we created ourselves based off of the data, our analysis of it. We have institutions and then branch campuses, but we also have locations that uh, are in private companies and hotels. That was new information to me, and this is a really important part of the higher ed ecosystem that I, I worry we're missing out on. Um, Community-based agencies, could be fire departments putting on programs, for example. We have military bases coded. Uh, we've got um, what I believe might be early college, high schools, or dual enrollment programs in K through 12 education settings. Uh, we have inter institutional programs. I'm turning all these off just to kind of uh, level set for a second. But we have uh, sometimes there are centers that have a lot of different campuses together providing um, uh, programs uh, to students. There are programs, of course, in hospitals and medical uh, facilities, correctional facilities. Uh, Big House on the Prairie is a book I'm still working through, but uh, it's very, very fascinating on uh, the relationship between uh, prison, uh, industrial complex, and rural areas. Um, and we also have extension offices, administrative units. Um, if we also turn off these branch campuses, those are kind of our main campus institutions. 
And I'm gonna, I know I'm running a little bit short on time. I'm gonna zoom to the place most familiar to me, which uh, here, and I'm also trying to demonstrate some of the ways you could use this tool. Um, you could uh, zoom to a particular state. Uh, I'm from uh, Michigan, so Michigan and Indiana, right there on the border, uh, which can maybe provide some great um, uh, discontinuities for researchers interested in finding um, sometimes um, counterfactuals. Um, for example, um, there are people who live on one side of a state line who don't have tuition agreements with uh, the colleges on the other side of the state line, for example. But uh, I'm going to go to Michigan, and um, this commuting zone, I'm going to use just to illustrate something for three minutes here. So just kind of hold tight uh, as, I, as I work my way through here. Um, this commuting zone uh, is in Southwest Michigan. Uh, the Indiana line just goes directly across uh, here, but uh, this particular commuting zone using that, remember that uh, uh, labor to work data, people work back and forth across state lines all the time. And so in this area that's reflected here. Uh, and so uh, I grew up in uh, St. Joe County, Michigan. And so you can toggle these county borders on if you'd like. And so um, St. Joe County is right here. Um, and there is uh, Glen Oaks Community College uh, I saw uh, Erica Orion's on the call from Michigan Community Colleges uh, representing uh, Glen Oaks. So um, uh, this is a rural county though. Um, and the commuting zone itself though is not rural. It's only about 8% rural. And you can see that over here on the left, if you were to get the migration and demographic data, you can see that the share of the population in a non-metro county is 8%. And that's because South Bend and Elkhart, Indiana are big, big uh, urban areas. And then this uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan is also represented here. So you got a lot of urban areas, but you have these kind of rural fringes around. Um, but the point that I'm trying to share here is that if I were to go to iPads or even to some of the uh, uh, consumer facing data tools that US Department of Education provides like the College Navigator, uh, they oftentimes will tie into iPads data. And uh, somebody might say, well, I don't, even have, I don't have a program nearby. Um, and uh, the reason I got really interested in this geography work is my family's all up here on the border between Elkhart County and St. Joe County. Uh, and during the Great Recession, 25% um, of uh, the county was all unemployed, including everybody in my family for several months, including um, some extensions up to two years. And um, the economists uh, of education would say, well, you're out of work. That means your, your opportunity costs uh, are, are easier for you to just go back to school. And like nobody went back to school, not in any of our family circles. And it was hiding in plain sight. Nobody went back to school because there's no schools around, especially if you're right there on the border uh, and you don't have a reciprocity with say Glen Oaks or with um, uh, Southwest Michigan College, for example. Um, but, uh, but you do have uh, this Mennonite biblical seminary and you got Goshen College. And these are small private liberal arts colleges. They're not only selective, expensive, but also mission uh, oriented uh, towards something that maybe isn't relevant to all the people who are living in this uh, what I started to call an education desert. And I'm not sure I like that uh, deficit framing, but um, here we go though. This tool can help us expose that, wait a second, there's actually a lot more here than what uh, we might assume. So we have branch campuses now in the mix, uh, thanks to that DAP of data. So now Ivy Tech Community College and all the branch locations starting to show up. We have uh, programs that have been, at least historically, offered in uh, private companies and hotels. Indiana Wesleyan is, is all in this game, uh, which is just fascinating by itself. Um, uh, miscellaneous community agencies. I don't think there are any military bases or uh, correctional facilities in this region, but you do have partnerships with schools, uh, different inter-institutional inter programs and centers and so forth. But you can start to see that there's a lot more um, uh, post-secondary going on uh, than maybe what at first glance uh, we would have assumed. Uh, it doesn't mean there aren't problems. It doesn't mean there aren't inequalities, aren't structural uh, patterns that we could really understand and expose, but it does mean that um, our our data tool here that we have uh, available and we want uh, to share with more people is it's got a lot of new information in it that we just hope that researchers on the call might be very interested in, in exploring even further. And so it is 146. I I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll share just three quick further research questions uh, and then uh, and then I'll um, hand it over to uh, Kirsten, I believe. So for the research, I, I hope that that kind of quick guide uh, through the tool is at least useful, give you something to jump into and be familiar with. Um, but with that in mind, and from the report and from the discussions that Jared, Josh, and Audrey and I had uh, along with Kirsten and Andrew along the way, is we really think it's gonna be helpful to develop this idea of a rural located college out even further. There are rural places that are doing great economically and demographically. Um, there are rural places that aren't um, also. And understanding those differences is really important so we don't treat them as a monolith. I think that's a big, a big step that we'd like to make um, next. 
We also think there's great promise in using commuting zones. As I showed this Michigan and Indiana deal, there are places all over the country that do share state borders um, that could be useful for, for further research. Uh, but we also think just using the commuting zones could be very useful for um, mapping colleges, understanding where people make their uh, labor decisions and see whether that's really connected with their educational decisions as well. It might not be. Um, and finally, uh, we'd really love to see um, how DAPIP could maybe expand our view of what counts um, as, a, as an institution or a post-secondary opportunity. So uh, Kirsten, I, I believe I'm gonna hand it back to you. How about that? Great. Um, thanks so much, Nick, um, and thanks so much uh, to the two of you um, for that overview of uh, how you approach this work and then a demonstration of how to use the actual tools themselves. Nick, I'm going to start. There's a, a question in the chat that I want to make sure is raised, and then, um, Andrew, I want to go back to a, a question that you answered in the chat and see if you could provide a little bit more context um, about that one. But, but starting with you, um, Nick, there's a question. Um, does your work take into consideration or categorize community college and university partnerships? So for example, rural community colleges that offer BA degrees due to a collaboration with a state university that is located in an urban area? That is a great question. We, we start to do that. And I don't know how precise we have done it yet. We haven't really audited this well, but based at least off of the names that are available in the DAPIP data set, if there's a an additional location. So if there's a college and it says, for example, I don't know, um, uh, Madison Area, Area Technical College at um, La Crosse or something like that, uh, some other city, our code would pick that up and sort of put them in an inter-institutional category. And so I believe that that's where you would go to find those, these inter-institutional locations. Uh, but again, they're not totally uh, ironed out either. Great. Um, and then is there any interest in mapping high schools into your tools? So I think this is a, a, qu a question for the two of you. Um, any interest in mapping high schools onto your tools, possibly through NCES uh, tools like the school locator, um, in order to get a picture of high school morality and that relationship to college aspirations and enrollment? So this is a really good question. Um, Right now, our team, we don't have uh, plans to add high schools. Um, I think one of the things that we have done is set this up that you can link it in with NCS data uh, from like the Common Core of Data and other places like that for K-12. Um, and so we sort of make it that you can sort of link all of them together. Um, but at least for our project for now, we really wanna make the rural college, rural serving institutions the, the central focus um, and hopefully that there are other folks in the field that are really interested in this and want to take it extra steps to add other layers for different sectors of education. Um, similar answer uh, on our team. We don't have plans. It'd be very interesting. A lot of potential there. Great. Um, Andrew, I was wondering if you could just give a little bit more um, uh, voiceover uh, to the question that you answered in the chat about um, how you identified students from rural communities and how you recommend others might think about using these metrics. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, with this rural serving piece, right, like we have to come up with some sort of proxy um, in the absence of that direct enrollment measure um, that we have for other uh, demographic groups and iPads. We had a couple of something that we felt pretty good uh, about as being able to sort of talk about institutions being in areas where they're likely to be drawing a lot more rural students than other regions. And so, you know, one of the first things we did was think about, you know, what data sets are out there that tell us anything about this. And we'd actually stumbled into some data from NIPSAS, the National Post-Secondary student aid study um, that they basically are at, through aggregated data they don't you can't, you're not looking at each individual but it's we're sort of looking at students from different locales rural urban suburban colleges in different locales rural rural suburban urban and where students from certain types of communities are going to colleges in certain types of communities and what we saw and it was very clear starkly clear rural located colleges are enrolling an overwhelming majority of their students who are coming from rural communities. 
And when we look at urban students, less than 10% of them were making it to rural colleges. And so for us, that was a really clear indicator that institutions in more rural places are just by that picking up more rural students. This also comes you know, with work from people like Nick and others who like talk about how far students travel to college and that really looking at most of them stay pretty close to home. And so looking at where the institution is, the rurality of that, accounting for folks staying relatively close, that's how we were able to use these things as a proxy and looking at adjacent counties beyond just the one where the institution is to try to build a workable region where we could measure the population pieces uh, as well and feel pretty comfortable that in the absence of the ideal, right, the, the direct enrollment measure, we've got something that we're pretty comfortable with. And especially because we built it as an index score, none of those things puts an institution in or out in our consideration. Um, and so that we're also sort of comfortable embracing a little bit of that gray area and nuance there. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, we do have a few minutes left. So if um, there are any other outstanding questions, feel free to, to put them in the chat here. There is one more um, that's come up. Um, and it says, um, so Nick, your comment about the, the branch and parent campuses, uh, made me wonder about that relationship as a factor in the complexity of understanding rural institutions and their students. And so wondering if you explored this facet of institution types. Uh, thanks for asking that, Jillian. Uh, great to see you. Um, table six in our report starts to get at that. We have not looked at that question or answered that question in any depth, but at least at first glance, we see a couple of patterns that seem really interesting to understand those relationships that might be unique or at least more pronounced in rural places. And that's going to be one with local community colleges and uh, dual enrollment programs What is what we assume these might be, but their relationship with uh, local K-12 public schools. So there's that something happening in rural places more so than in, in other places, I believe. Um, so I would look at these K-12 partnerships. Um, correctional facilities is very interesting. I don't know that it's more so interesting in rural than in non-rural places, uh, but that's definitely something there. Um, and I'm just kind of skimming through table six briefly. Um, and I think it's those branch campuses in general. There's just a lot more of them that we're probably, uh, we, I'd love to know more about. Um, this can maybe help us try to understand. Great. Um, and then a, a question that um, that I have for the two of you, I know as you both uh, were working on these projects um, with your teams, this was an incredible uh, learning opportunity for me and for the Ascendium team um, as we really uh, deepened our work in the rural post-secondary space. Um, and I'm wondering if you could each share just a little bit about um, what really surprised you uh, about this process um, and the work that you did? Because I feel like in so many conversations, there were so many aha moments. Um, and I'm wondering if you could share just some of the things that were really surprising to you and your team um, as you completed this work. I would say, at least from our end, um, this project has sort of been, was on my wish list for years as a scholar before it actually happened. And in part, those years were filled with it's really hard, it's really messy. And so, you know, who knows how that sort of comes out. I think even then, surprised at how many iterations you go through um, and trying this thing and that they're, you know, especially with rural being hard to sort of nail down in one definition, there's a lot of it that we were having to sort of look at and say, does this list look right? and how these things are breaking, does it make sense? And with those three fields that we pulled, we even tried some other things that are like not uniquely rural, but are important for rural, like around education, health professions, and the list just blew up because we were getting health sciences schools in downtown Houston. Um, and so, you know, we were, I think for, for, for us, there was sort of the surprise that even folks who know how tricky and complicated these questions are, just how many times you're going back and saying, well, mate, what about, what about this? What about that? And just from our, for sort of the results that we sort of put out more descriptively, one of the things that I think we were really pleased about is how this really showed these institutions uh, as engines of economic justice 
as engines of racial equity. Um, we have a third of HBCUs are RSIs, nearly 20% of Hispanic serving institutions, 94% of tribal colleges, native, 93% of high native enrolling non-tribal colleges. You look at the economic indicators, 83% of institutions in low employment counties are RSIs. Two thirds in persistent poverty counties, RSIs. Um, and so they're really in places where they're serving communities and populations that deeply rely on these institutions for things like oper economic opportunity and mobility and broader community well-being. And so just have that through really clearly, I think was a great way of illustrating that rurality and rural serving institutions are not what they often get painted to be. Oh, that's great. I yeah share a lot of those similar experiences with our team. Um, I would add, I think there's a technical thing that was a big surprise. And then there's more of like a just a different way of thinking that I've really grown through in this process. The technical one is, I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but the data systems are just so messy. Uh, and Jared <laughs> Colston uh, wrangled what are, AP, what are called API calls in order to link these locations addresses to actual latitudes and longitudes. And like the promise of, of really making the most of this public data is there. And I think that uh, that's something that's really exciting and surprising to me of just how much potential is there. Like we're just, we've got a lot of room where we can keep growing and that's exciting. Um, the, uh, the more conceptual side that I've been surprised by and I've been really reflective on is I think um, when I first started doing some of this work in geography, uh, uh, you know, food deserts was kind of like the thing, the, the terminology that's, that resonated with me when thinking about educational geography opportun of opportunity. And so I start calling uh, places education deserts. And the more I think about that, the more I'm like, oh, it's kind of deficit oriented. And I've really been um, surprised by, and I shouldn't be surprised by the assets of rural places. And you know, not all rural places are, are dying on the vine. And like, there's a lot of vibrancy in rural areas and the assets that are in these places are critical. And so to really be aware of that asset center is, uh, is where I'm kind of left with. <laughs> 